The object I'm going to talk about is quite small. It's only about 12 inches by 15 inches, but it's packed with meaning. It's an icon in the National Icon Collection in the British Museum. And it was bought in 1998 with the help of the National Art Collections Fund. It was shown in the recent Byzantium exhibition at the Royal Academy in London and it's generally thought to have been painted about 1400, although it might be a little earlier than that. It's what's called a feast icon. That is, it was made for the liturgical celebration of one of the feast days in the Orthodox Church. And there are a couple of others, um, a little later in date, with slight variations. And we also find the same scene on 16th century wall paintings. This icon is not immediately understandable and accessible, like many of the icons you would probably recognize. Say, for example, the Russian icon of Our Lady of Vladimir, or one of the countless icons of Christ. Like many Byzantine icons, it had writing on it to identify the figures but this is badly damaged and we're helped a bit by the fact that we have a later copy of about 1500 and part of the word orthodoxy can just be made out on the right hand side of our icon but any Byzantine would have known what it was and what it commemorated even if they couldn't identify every single person in it this icon looks back for more than five centuries to a much earlier date. It commemorates the ending of the long struggle over religious images in Byzantium, which went on for more than a century and came to an end when images were finally vindicated in AD 843. The ending of that controversy was known and still is known as the triumph of orthodoxy and a new church feast or holy day was established, the Feast of Orthodoxy. It's still celebrated in Orthodox churches every year on the first Sunday of Lent. So as I said, our icon is a feast icon which would be brought out annually for the Feast of Orthodoxy. And the most important figures of the many figures shown in it, there are two layers or two ranges of figures, the most important ones are the ones in the top, the 9th century Empress Theodora and her son, the Emperor Michael III, shown as a small child next to his mother, and the Patriarch Methodius, who presided over the official ending of iconoclasm, the attack on religious images, in the 8th and 9th centuries. In the scene on the icon, the human figures are ranged round another one, another icon, a very famous one, but that one has been lost for centuries. This is an icon of the Virgin, the Mother of God, holding the child, in a posture that was copied again and again in countless other examples in Byzantine and Italian art. It's flanked by two angels. The Virgin was often shown as guarded by angels, and it was known as the Hodigitria in Greek she who points the way and was believed to have been brought to Constantinople from Jerusalem in the 5th century AD and to have been painted originally by Saint Luke. This icon has disappeared but it was the most important one in Constantinople and it was loved by everybody. They identified it with the city this was the icon which the Emperor Michael VIII Palaeologus followed on foot when he entered Constantinople in 1261 and restored Byzantine rule after 50 years of Crusader occupation. It was housed in a monastery named after it, known as the Hodigon. And in later centuries we learn from foreign visitors that it was publicly displayed on a weekly basis on Tuesdays by its own members of a confraternity who had special red outfits. So this great lost icon is painted, as it were, inside our Triumph of Orthodoxy icon. It's shown in the form in which, as we know from other representations, it was displayed and venerated 
in and after the 13th century. The other figures in our icon are all supporters of icons, some of whom had endured persecution, imprisonment or even branding by the iconoclast emperors. So this is an icon that commemorates an event. Why though should it have been produced at the end of the 14th century? This was also a time when Byzantine orthodoxy had been vindicated after three church councils and debates between the Western monk Barlaam of Calabria and the great Orthodox saint Gregory Palamas over Palamas's teachings. These 14th century councils were held in the very same church in Constantinople where the triumph of orthodoxy had been proclaimed in 843. And behind those 14th century disputes, of course, lay the deeper division enormously heightened by the bitter experience of the Crusades between the Orthodox Byzantines and the Latins or the Catholic West. So this icon tells a story and it reasserts the claims of Eastern Orthodoxy over the West. It doesn't perhaps have the immediate aesthetic and spiritual appeal of so many orthodox icons. It needs to be decoded. We often see icons in museums as though they're art objects. That's not how the Byzantines saw them. And this icon, like others, would be kissed and revered by every worshipper who came into the church for the liturgy on the Sunday of Orthodoxy. When you see now how Orthodox Christians greet the icons when they go into a church, like greeting members of the family, as Metropolitan Callistos Ware said, one is aware that they're infinitely more than just pictures. What was affirmed in 843 and reaffirmed in this icon around 1400 was the understanding that the divine had manifested itself to us in certain specific ways that the martyrs and the saints pointed the way to God whose will the angels helped to carry out that the annunciation to Mary her pregnancy the birth of Christ his miracles his suffering with Mary at the foot of the cross and his ascension were part of the divine economy which was God's plan for mankind and the truth of which was revealed in icons Icons in the Orthodox tradition are quite simply about truth. They're not all easy to understand for someone brought up in the Western church tradition. And yet, the cues for exhibitions like the one at the Royal Academy recently show again and again that many people today who are not Orthodox and often not even Christian respond instinctively to Byzantine icons, as the Byzantines did so many centuries ago. Complex and theological as this icon is, icons have a powerful appeal to religious people and the unchurched alike. They really are, to use phrases often used before by others, windows to the soul and artifices of eternity. <laughs>